Okay, well, uh, good morning everyone, and it's great to be here. I'm going to talk today about 10 commandments of influencing politicians. And my aim is to provide a few suggestions uh, to you on how to get your projects supported by politicians, or perhaps get your good ideas adopted. And as you can see uh, from the menu, part of this is about getting partnerships with politicians. But what I want to say to you today is that having a partnership isn't enough. You've actually got to get the politicians to do something with it and to adopt your idea, whether it's uh, supporting a project or changing legislation or introducing a new policy. Now, I'm going to be talking from my experience, that's me on the left there, like all politicians wearing a hard hat and a vest. One lesson, politicians love infrastructure announcements. And that's me with an umbrella when I was Water Minister, and the only time it ever rained when I was Water Minister was when I announced restrictions. <laughs> and on the right, there are some of my fans. Uh, that's a, uh, that's a uh, demonstration of support from the Mountain Cattlemen for uh, the policies that were adopted uh, in getting cattle out of the Alpine National Park. But when I was Minister, I think that does highlight one aspect of the environment that you're involved in, and that is it is often intensely political. It is a bit different from, say, lobbying for sporting facilities or community development, which is generally pretty apolitical and widely supported. In the environment, so often, there are two sides, and so you have to understand the politics if you're going to be successful. So, just to give you a few of the political issues that I was associated with in the environment, where in many cases environmental groups were lobbying on one side and there were others on the other. In climate change, five-star building efficiency, uh, the first place in Australia that introduced that for, for new buildings, or the Victorian Renewable Energy Target, the Energy Efficiency Target, <coughs> or in water where there was a huge issue around the drought and the health of our rivers and for the first time we gave the environment a legislative right to water. And similarly in urban water conservation, the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, marine parks in the Great Otway National Park and banning cattle grazing in the Alpine Park. And I'll use these cases as I talk as case studies for how to influence politicians. People like me when I was Environment Minister. <coughs> and my strong message today is that you've got to study politics. Now, many of you will have seen David Attenborough's show, Life on Earth. You know how he creeps around looking at the, looking at the insects? And, well, in a way, that's what you've got to do with political life. I'm saying to you, you have to creep around and look at those politicians like they're some sort of weird form of biodiversity. And in a way they are. <laughs> and indeed, the biodiversity keeps changing. But if you're going to influence this, this weird biodiversity, you've got to study it. And I guess one of the first things to do is understand the nature of modern government. And of course, you see the two leaders of the main parties in Australia there today, Bill Short and Malcolm Turnbull. One thing to understand about politics is that power is very much at the top these days. And all politicians, from the Prime Minister down right through all the other ministers, are under intense time pressure. Just to give an example of this, I read a biography of Andrew Fisher, who was Australia's, I think, fourth Prime Minister. While he was Prime Minister, he travelled to the UK for three months just to meet people in the UK and left a, a, a replacement Prime Minister here. Now imagine that today. It's 24 hours a day, <coughs> the time pressure is incredibly intense, and there's this perpetual campaigning and conflict. And there's also 24-hour media power. Social media never stops. There's a new media cycle every few hours. 
And at the same time, there's extreme expectations from many stakeholder groups. An expectation of community engagement, a lot of the issues are complex. Most of the issues in government have a strong focus on the market, and Treasury tends to dominate many of the policy decisions. And all of that, that time pressure, that level of uh, complexity leads to two things that you need to understand. First is that your issue is not the only priority of government. And the second is that governments tend to rely on trusted advisors. Because there's so much complexity, there's so little time, politicians don't have time to work things out for themselves, for, for themselves so they very much rely on some trusted advisors to help them. Now just to put the way politics works here in Victoria and other places in a context, conceptually I find this helps. Around the outside you'll see the external <coughs> political arena. And that's the media, the voters, lobby groups, people like most of us here today. But then on the inside we have the internal, behind closed doors, where a lot of the real power is. And that's the politicians, the bureaucrats. And how do you bridge between those two? And I, I think there are two ways you do, and I put them in blue there. One is the trusted advisors. <coughs> they're the people that may not be behind the closed doors all the time, but they're trusted to give advice to government, and so they get in behind the closed doors. And the other group there in blue is what I call the policy subsystem. And that, I think, is the real opportunity for many of you here today to be involved in. Now, a policy subsystem is a group of people from a number of different backgrounds and sectors who come together around a particular policy. And I'll give you a, an example I work in now in urban water. People involved in integrated water management in the urban context. They might be academics, they might be local government, you know, people might be from a local council, or uh, they might be from water authorities, or they might be actual government bureaucrats. And that tends to bridge between the inside political arena and the outside. And in the middle in red I've got superpowers, you might be wondering who that is, that's basically the Premier and Treasurer, because if they're against something it's pretty hard to get it up. But just focusing on that policy subsystem, one of the key messages I give today is be part of one of those. Join a network. And networking, and I've really seen this since I've left politics, is the way that people can get their foot in the door, they can learn about what's happening, and they can communicate with politicians and government and decision makers. So whether it's conferences or workshops or writing papers, I strongly <laughs> urge you to get in behind the door. And then we have to think how is policy actually made, how decisions are made. And there's lots of different academic theories about this, but I, I prefer this sort of theory which some people call the dustbin theory, where everything gets thrown in and decisions might become made because of politics down the bottom left where a particular politician, the Premier, has a strong view. And I think a good example we've seen in Victoria is the level crossing removals, which really came from the strong views that the Premier and Treasurer had. Or there are policy options, good ideas, that are out there floating in the community. And I remember when I was in government, I think Marine National Parks was a good example of that. Lots of different groups had this view, whether it was environment groups, tourist groups, local councils. <coughs> or they can come from problems like the drought. That was a major problem and that actually motivated a lot of action. And then you've got policy entrepreneurs. I don't know, are any of you, do you think of yourself as a policy entrepreneur? A bit like a business entrepreneur, but you're creative and innovative in coming up with good policy ideas, whether you're in government or outside. Then you've got stakeholders who might be green groups, farmers, businesses, 
Oh, sorry. And you've got experts, scientists. But what you usually need in all these cases is a window, a window of opportunity for the politicians to, to make the decision. And that's what you have to seize if you're going to really make a change. Now, what I want to do now is using that background, from my experience, talk through 10 commandments of influencing government. And the first commandment, which seems pretty obvious, is know what you want to achieve and be clear about it. And it is amazing, I've found as a minister, how many people came up to you and wanted to speak to you, but actually didn't have a clear recommendation. You really, before you do anything else, have to work out very clearly what is it you want to achieve and put it in words that the politician will understand. And I think one of the greatest examples of this I ever saw was Peter Cullen and the Wentworth Group with their uh, blueprint for the living continent back in, I think, about 2002 or three, where they had a very clear agenda of clarifying water rights for farmers, restoring environmental flows for the rivers like the Murray, ending uh, broad-scale land clearing, and measurement of water use. Very clear, specific <laughs> objective. And one reason I was so influential. But knowing what you want is not enough. You also have to know what the government wants. And you need to study that. Once again, I've been surprised when I've talked to groups how little they know about what the government's actual policies and strategies are. And you have to research that. And once again, going back to my time in government and the, the mid-2000s, the drought, for the Howard government, the national government, getting a balance between farmers' rights and the environment was a clear desire of the Howard government at the time. Not a particularly environmental government, but a government that had to resolve this issue of what are we going to do about the Murray and, and the drought. And so that's once again why Peter Cullen was so influential at that time in influencing the national government. <coughs> Third thing is come with solutions, not problems. Very easy to identify a problem, but don't forget the politicians are so busy, they're so worn down by conflict that they don't want another problem. They want a solution. And if there's one organisation, and this isn't in the environmental field, but if there's one organisation that's great at coming up with solutions for government, it seems to be transurban. You know, they've demonstrated that if you come to government with a plan that shows, in this case, how they can build um, a whole lot of linking roads in, in the west or improve the, improve the freeway system, governments grab it because the solution is there. And I think also, when you're coming, you need to understand the means and the mechanics of your recommendation. Understand that government doesn't have total power to do everything. It's going to have to deal with stakeholders. So how does your proposal actually work? And have you worked that out? Now, if you're going to form any sort of partnership, it's pretty good to, understand, to think about where the politician you're wanting to partner is in his or her political life cycle. And that little diagram re represents my journey through politics. I went through a very nasty pre-selection where I actually defeated my old boss. Uh, I was elected to parliament. I became a backbench MP. And when you're a backbench MP, really, you, you don't have a lot of power and you have quite a lot of time. And you're looking for friends. Well, that was my experience. And that's the time. That's the time when, if you want to start partnering, you want to start partnering because very shortly after that, I became an opposition spokesperson. You become very busy, and what you're really interested in is getting in the media. Then we won government amazingly, and you become a minister. And suddenly, I had a whole office of people trying to stop me from seeing you. I remember. <laughs> And so 
the, the, the lesson I'd say from all of that is if you're going to form partnerships, form them early. Form them with backbench MPs. Form them at a time you can build a real relationship, not when you're just seen to be trying to get something from someone. And if you do that, you'll end up having a partner for life. Because that person, even as they come through as an opposition spokesperson or a minister, will see you as a trusted advisor. Fifth, very importantly, come as a team. Collaborate. If you can get farmers, environmentalists, business, unions, all working together, you're much more likely to have influence. But when you do come, you've got to be prepared and be persistent. And an outstanding example of that was the uh, Victoria National Parks Association in their advocacy for getting cattle out of the national parks, who persisted for over 40 years in producing the science and advocating with government. And then you have to choose the right time, seize the opportunity, think, is this the time that your idea is going to meet government objectives? And just as examples of being prepared, I've put up an uh, organisation I'm involved with. Now, Climate Works, we need a pathway for Australia to move to net zero. But what we sought to show was the business case for this, how this is good for the economy, it's good for jobs, and it met the government's objective, not just in climate and the environment, but in economics as well. Now, if you are going to come to government and you're prepared, you've also got to communicate. <coughs> and you've got to do it in a smart way. And if you're going to do that successfully, you've got to understand the power of emotion. It's not just about facts. And you've got to think about the message that you're conveying and who's conveying it. It's not always best if it's conveyed by the boss, often getting a citizen, a community member, a farmer, a, a, a mother to present it is much more emotionally moving than if you do it in a conventional way. And once again, a good example, I think, of emotional <coughs> advocacy was the VNPA's campaign to get cattle out of the Alpine National Park, where they showed very clearly the difference on the left between native vegetation in the park and on the right, the results of cattle. So think about pictures, emotions. And then finally, and this is the one often I've found environment groups have trouble with, you have to prioritise and compromise. You've got to get the result that you're after. And that means, in some cases, getting an agreement, a compromise. And if you do all of those things, you've got the Ten Commandments there, I think you'll have real influence. Thank you.